I'm Ben Eggleton here, professor at the University of Sydney, for those that are dialing in from elsewhere. Um, and I'm just going to very briefly welcome John Rogers, who is a good friend of mine. We were very close colleagues at Bell Labs many years ago, and he was, um, we were both at our prime, I guess. Um, and we did some great work together. It's great that John could join us for this Sydney Nano Distinguished Seminar. Um, I'll let Omid give the brief bio, but it's fair to say John is one of the most dynamic, multidisciplinary, energetic, and nice guys. So thanks, John, for joining us. Over to you, Omid. I look forward to this fantastic seminar. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, Welcome everyone to another Sydney Nano Distinguished Lecture. I begin with paying my respect to First Nation custodians of the country uh, throughout New South Wales, in particular, Gadigal people of your own nation, um, the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Sydney is built. I pay my respect to their elders past and present and emerging. We are very fortunate to have Professor John Rogers from Northwestern University will deliver today's distinguished lecture on semiconductor nanomaterials for neural interfaces. Professor John Rogers does not need uh, much introduction with nearly 130,000 citations and a three digit pitch index. I could only guess how many of you have heard, interested or being inspired by his research and groundbreaking works that are regularly published in you know, um, quality journals. Um, he has a long list of achievements, awards and recognitions, I'll just mention a few. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering and Sciences in the US. He's a Louis Simpson and Kimberly Query Professor of Material Science and Engineering and Biomedical Engineering and Medicine at Northwestern University and leads his Center for Biointegrated Electronics. Uh, he got Benjamin Franklin uh, Medal for um, Franklin Institute. Um, from, Frank, uh, from Franklin Institute, the Material Research Society Medal in 2018, uh, Simpsonian Award for American Ingenuity and in Physical Sciences in 2013, MacArthur Fellowship in 2009, and Lemelson MIT Prize in 2011. His team also recently, very recently actually, put one of their variable breakthroughs, breakthrough technologies to help monitor COVID symptom uh, um, the symptoms the list is actually very long i'm sure everyone is here to hear from uh professor rogers so without further ado i just ask uh everyone to mute their mics and turn off your videos this session is being recorded as we speak and i hand over the mic to john and i say a few things after the talk regarding questions yep hand over to you john Okay, great. Hey, thanks, uh, Omid, for that very kind uh, introduction. It's a wonderful opportunity to share some of our research with this community uh, today and uh, also to, to reconnect with uh, Ben a little bit. Uh, as he mentioned, um, you know, we overlapped, uh, gosh, I guess it's a quarter of a century ago now, right? 25 years. It's like mind boggling, but we were both at Bell Labs and uh, I don't know, maybe he was in his prime. I don't think I've really ever experienced my prime. All I know is I'm over the hill at this point. So, uh, but those, those were great times, great, great experiences. And uh, anyway, it's good, good to catch up with Ben again. So I'm gonna share my screen and dive into the, to the presentation. So um, I had a chance to poke around on, on the website associated with this Nano Institute. It looks very exciting. And I was able to look at the, what is it, grand challenges, or I can't remember the language it was used on the website, and uh, tried to identify different things that my group is engaged in that sort of have intersection points with those uh, research areas. And uh, it looked to me like one, one of the uh, areas of activity was in uh, neural interfaces. And I thought, okay, great, you know, we do a lot of uh, neural interface work. And so I put together a slide that kind of summarizes um, you know, our work in this area, a little bit of a historical perspective, but uh, kind of bringing you up to speed on what we're doing uh, currently and um, you know, including some unpublished results that I'll highlight toward the end of the talk. So the, so the title is Semiconductor Nanomaterials for Neural Interfaces. So it's this nano for neural type, type of space. And uh, you know, we have our own uh, sort of angle and approaches here. There's a lot of exciting work obviously happening in this area. Brain science is a, is a hot space. I think it's a real powerful scientific frontier. A lot of fundamental questions in biology, 
neuroscience, but in the context of uh, problems whose solutions could actually have an impact on how we treat neural disorders. So there's a real kind of societal aspect to it as well. And it's really that collection of things that have uh, drawn us and attracted us to this particular area of, um, of scientific research. So, so I'll start out just giving you a context of um, you know, what we're up to, how we think about this area from the vantage point of a material scientist. That's, that's kind of my core area of expertise, the mot motivations and what we hope to do and, and some of the schemes, some of the material approaches, the, the fabrication um, strategies and, and the device designs that have worked pretty well for us in two different platforms. And I'll step you through these sequentially. The first is um, you know, inflexible sort of biocompatible electronic membranes for both high speed spatial temporal mapping of electrical activity associated with neural networks in the brain, for example, but, but surface mounted uh, in that context, being able to sort of monitor those processes and also um, electrically stimulate um, you know, or inhibit the activity of individual neurons is powerful in that context. And so I'll give you a sense of the, the approaches that we've used to develop those sorts of electronic neural interfaces. But, but I think one, one area that we find extremely um, you know, exciting and, and fruitful is, is thinking beyond electronic interfaces to optoelectronic interfaces. So you're doing electronic engagement, but also optical means for modulating neural activity and monitoring neural activity as well. Uh, and there we've uh, really built out a portfolio of devices where the key innovation is ultra miniaturization in, in, in terms of sizes of optoelectronic components so that they can be mounted on very thin filamentary probes that can be inserted into targeted regions of the deep brain. And, and I'll describe kind of what we're doing in that space. Uh, and so as was mentioned, my affiliation is Northwestern. I got my career start like been at Bell Labs, that was great experience, sort of oriented me toward, you know, a way to do scientific research that also intersects with engineering and technology. And so you'll hear that kind of flavor, that Bell Labsian approach, hopefully, you know, as I step through through the slide uh, deck. And so a lot of it is, you know, kind of fundamental academic science, but but with aspirations to develop new neuroengineering platforms that, that can, uh, you know, have a societal benefit and maybe also be used as tools for neuroscience discovery. And so it's kind of Bell Labs in worldview. But my uh, home uh, appointment is in material science and engineering, but a lot of what we do is very highly interdisciplinary, kind of, kind of as you'll see uh, as I move, move through, through the content. So that, that's kind of an overview. So in terms of the, the grand challenge that, that we like to think about is, you know, how do you build uh, man-made microsystems technologies in general, you know, so uh, integrated circuits, microelectromechanical systems, microfluidic systems, optoelectronic devices that, that can intimately integrate with uh, living organisms, um, you know, biological tissues, the human body, uh, ultimately, uh, to uh, support a, uh, a persistent, high-quality, high-information content interface for sort of um, bilateral exchange uh, of, of information from biology to the man-made systems and, and back again uh, to, to uh, potentially offer sort of closed loop type operation. And that kind of vision is uh, probably most easy to understand in the context of the brain, which is biology's most sophisticated form of electronics. And if you want to understand how the brain operates, you want to develop new sort of engineering approaches to delivering therapies to, to the brain, you might uh, ideally like to bring to bear to that problem man's most sophisticated form of electronics, the silicon integrated circuit. But if you think about the challenges there, um, they're, they're pretty obvious. They're radically different in terms of their geometrical forms, their mechanical properties. You have soft, squishy, time dynamic tissues of, of, of the brain. And, and on, on the other hand, you know, silicon integrated circuit is a static, rigid, planar thing. You know? And so from a material standpoint, how do you bridge that gap? How do you make electronics look more like biology? And if you could do that, you, you would certainly be interested in integrating with the brain, but also probably other parts of the neural uh, the nervous system, right? The spinal cord, the, the peripheral nerves, other vital organs such as the heart, maybe even the skin. We've done things in the kidney. Uh, and so th this is sort of what we, we have in mind is sort of soft electronics for the human body. So soft biocompatible electronics that can be uh, intimately interfaced for, for long periods of time uh, for both monitoring and, and stimulation. So in the context of the brain, the, the, the visual is sort of illustrated here on, on the left. I mean, I, you can imagine the challenges associated with taking, you know, a conventional silicon integrated circuit and like squishing it up against the brain. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work very well, although that's ideally what you would like to be able to do is to sort of merge those two 
types of uh, systems. And um, the way that that's been done in the past, and it's actually uh, a fairly powerful workhorse, is known as the Utah Array. So it's basically micro machine pins of conductive uh, silicon, doped silicon with exposed tips that terminate on the backside, uh, which, which supports sort of a planar platform that, that uh, serves as a mounting location for uh, a conventional wafer-based silicon integrated circuit. And then you take that whole thing and you uh, mount it on the brain using uh, what's called an air hammer. And that uh, induces some degree of penetration of each one of these pins into the surface of the brain by, by different amounts. And so in that way, you kind of accommodate the geometrical mismatch between the planar silicon uh, circuit and the curvilinear texture uh, of the brain. Uh, but, but you don't do anything to solve the uh, mechanical modulus mismatch because now essentially what you have are sort of rigid pins in a bowl of jello that's moving around uh, as uh, respiration occurs and blood pulsatile blood flow uh, courses through the brain and the brain rattles around in the intracranial space. And so the consequence of having these hard materials interface uh, with these soft tissues is you get a, a disruption of the tissue electrode interface and, and a degradation in the um, you know, signal quality that you can capture with these types of platforms. So, so that's been a great uh, workhorse um, you know, device for doing neuroscience uh, research and brain machine interfaces. But like into the future, maybe you wanna think about something different. Again, something that's engineered to look like biology, soft, mechanically, shape conformal, built out of biocompatible materials. And that kind of sets the stage for you know, streams of research that um, you know, we've been pursuing in, in my group o over the last decade uh, or so. And so if you want to think about biointegration, it's, used to, it's useful to think about kind of the engineering design principles that you see in biology and not necessarily with an eye toward replicating those features directly into man-made systems, but just to develop an awareness of how biology is put together so that you can build devices that sort of harmonize and, and synergize uh, in terms of that, that kind of integration that, that we like to be able to achieve. And so from an engineering standpoint, I mean, sort of an obvious statement, there isn't uh, too, too many deep insights uh, you know, in this slide, but, but the, the engineering you know, uh, principles are really spectacularly sophisticated. I mean, you have active uh, structures with, you know, molecular length scales all the way up to sort of macro scale uh, dimensions. Um, you know, biology is intrinsically three-dimensional. It's fluidic, it's electronic, it's biochemical, it's dynamic, responsive, it's hard materials integrated with soft materials that are dynamic uh, and, and moving uh, mechanically. And so, you know, if you think about those, those kinds of features, you'd like to embody at least some abstraction of them in, into your electronics or your microsystem technology that you'd like to uh, sort of integrate with biology. And so in that broader context, we've been pursuing three different types of technologies and sort of uh, there are uh, intersection, intersections and overlaps and so on, but, but sort of three different types of uh, platforms. One involves the development of uh, thin soft membranes that, that can kind of um, support high quality electronic functionality, but with mechanics and uh, uh, mass densities and, and, and thermal loading that, that doesn't perturb uh, an intimate interface with uh, a biological system, as illustrated here with this sort of kid's temporary tattoo-like piece of electronics laminated onto the uh, epidermis in a way that doesn't mechanically constrain at all the natural motions of the skin uh, dur during um, you know, nat natural activities. And so, so that's one platform. And I'll start with a description of how that technology provides unique opportunities for inter integration with the brain and how the kinds of miniaturization ideas embedded here uh, allow for these sort of highly functional optoelectronic pe uh, penetrating filaments for, for brain interfaces. Uh, another platform is one in which the focus is around uh, electronic materials whose key defining characteristic is not only the ability to support high performance electronic functionality, but which are chemically degradable when exposed to uh, biofluids. So these can be viewed as transient, physically transient electronic devices that can serve as transient implants to offer functionality that's temporally coincident with a transient biological process, like a wound healing uh, process, for example. So like a resorbable suture, but with full electronic functionality at the level of biosensors, computing functionality, radio communication, and so on. And so we have 
quite uh, you know, extensive set of capabilities in this notion of biodegradable or transient electronics. And then the third area is thinking about extending beyond integration with surfaces, which are possible with these thin, flexible, soft membranes into three-dimensional volumetric spaces. So you think about the architecture of a neural network, for example, it's intrinsically 3D. and It's kind of an open network mesh type architecture. How can you build electronics in similar geometries has been a question that we've been working on for the last five years or so. And we have a number of techniques that allow, uh, allow one to, to build those kinds of constructs. So let me start with these kinds of uh, membranes and, and give you a description of how semiconductor nanomaterials become sort of key building blocks for, for all of these systems, but really uh, with an initial focus in this talk on, on these sort of biointerface soft membranes. And so, um, you know, that kind of platform has relevance not only, you know, in the context of the brain, but as I mentioned before, really all areas of the, of the nervous system, all, all of the peripheral nerves, including the very smallest ones, all up and down the length of the spinal cord. And this is a, a general area where there are a number of, um, you know, FDA approved medical devices that, that really are extremely effective at uh, treating various neural disorders as sort of bioelectronic medicine, sort of engineering approaches that can kind of complement more traditional pharmacological types of schemes for uh, treating diseases. And, and probably, um, you know, deep brain stimulators for addressing symptoms of Parkinson's disease represent, you know, one, one of the, uh, the most shining examples of that kind of, um, you know, neural interface as a therapy. And if you think about the future, it's going to involve not simple probes that uh, insert to, uh, you know, single locations in the brain as deep brain stimulators exist today, but they're going to involve all kinds of different sensing functionalities, multimodal uh, neural interfaces, maybe complex architectures, 3D layouts, soft mechanics, miniaturized designs, bioresorbable constructions. It's a really rich area, I think, for academic research and discovery where successes could, you know, potentially, uh, you know, uh, lead to new therapies to to treat um, you know serious disorders that are afflicting um, you know lar large uh, numbers of patients uh, worldwide and so that that's kind of the broader uh, context for for the rest of the content of the of the presentation. So the the question is how do you go from a uh, a planar rigid brittle form of electronics into one that is soft and uh, shape conformal for these sort of neural interface uh, systems and and one strategy might uh, involve um, you know reaching a conclusion that silicon as a, a semiconductor material is never going to work for biointerface devices because of its intrinsic mechanical properties. Uh, and that's kind of an, an, an intuition that, that has really driven a lot of work over the years in the development of polymer-based semiconductors or carbon nanotube-based semiconductors, small molecules, where you know there's, there's the sense that those classes of materials are more readily flexible and uh, you know, embodied with the kinds of mechanics that you would ultimately need for integration with soft, low modulus tissues. And um, we've worked in that direction um, uh, for a number of years, and, and there's still a robust set of academic efforts along those lines. And I think there's a lot of promise with that. But then the other strategy might be to say, well, silicon in a wafer-based form is not going to be any good, but is there some way I can deploy silicon into different geometry and a different sort of structural uh, form that would allow me to sort of build it in a, in a heterogeneous sort of composite sense uh, that, that would allow for the kind of mechanics I, I ultimately need for, for biointegration. It's really that strategy that's worked uh, by far the best for us. And, and the basic notion is that the, um, you know, the mechanics of a structure are defined partly by the intrinsic mechanical properties of the material itself, but also by the geometry. So you think about uh, a silicon wafer, it's partly rigid and brittle because the silicon is a high modulus material intrinsically, but it's also because the wafer is pretty thick. It's like a millimeter in thickness, maybe a half millimeter in thickness. And by making anything very thin, any kind of uh, material structure thin, you can reduce the bending stiffness very significantly because the bending stiffness is scaling like a cube of the thickness. So if you go from the thickness of a wafer, maybe a millimeter, down to the thickness of what we'll refer to as a nanomembrane, so where the thickness of the, the material structure is maybe you know, 100 nanometers or 10 nanometers or something like that, because of that cubic scaling, you can reduce the bending stiffness by 14, 15 orders of magnitude. And it's just Newtonian bending mechanics that's really governing that reduction. But whenever you change a physical property by 15 orders of magnitude, it really has a qualitative impact on the way you think about the material. So a silicon nanomembrane is actually a very flexible, floppy object. 
uh, not only because the bending stiffness is very low, but also because the peak strains associated with bending to a given radius of curvature are scaling down linearly with the thickness. So it's not only floppy, but it's also very bendable in the sense of the tightest bend radius that, can, that it can support before fracture. So that's a kind of a trivial observation, but it turns out to be a pretty important one because now you can create sort of device grade uh, silicon in these kind of nanoscale geometries and then use them as building blocks by integrating them onto a flexible plastic substrate or an elastomer uh, slab to, to begin to build heterogeneous combinations of hard and soft materials engineered in such a way that the overall system level properties are defined by the plastic or the rubber. Uh, only minimally mechanically loaded by the high modulus active electronic material, in this case, the silicon nanomembranes or nano ribbons. So if you think about that kind of heterogeneous integration, now you're talking about how do I manage the bonding interface between a piece of silicon and a piece of silicone rubber, for example. That's a very difficult uh, you know, interface to manage from an adhesion standpoint. But here, um, you know, thickness scaling comes to your rescue again because the energy release rate parameter G scales down linearly with thickness. So as I make the th uh, silicon thinner and thinner, the interface stresses that would otherwise tend to drive delamination from an underlying plastic or rubber substrate are suppressed uh, by a very significant amount uh, as you go from sort of a wafer scale object of silicon to something like a silicon nanomembrane. And that's kind of illustrated qualitatively here in the form of this SEM view of a uh, printed cantilever um, object of silicon sitting on top of a micro machine ridge on a piece of plastic. There are really no adhesives here. It's just Van der Waals forces that keep this in an, uh, a suspended state, cantilevered state. It's because of that uh, strong reduction of the energy release rate parameter G with thickness that allows you to do that. So silicon nanomembranes are interesting because they're very flexible, floppy, and at some level they're sticky. It's very easy to integrate them with the similar types of materials. So that's kind of the mechanics, the overall motivation of being interested in semiconductor nanomaterials in this con uh, context. Um, you know, the next question might be, how am I going to create that type of material in the first place? And uh, there's been a lot of work over the years in, in growth approaches for silicon nanowires and so on. Our thought is, um, you know, a little bit different, which is that a silicon wafer is already a spectacularly well-developed piece of materials technology. It's available at commodity cost. Could you use the silicon wafer as a source for creating these nanostructures of silicon? Turns out there are ways to do that. I won't go through the details, but some anisotropic etching chemistries allow you to shave off the near surface region of a device grade silicon wafer uh, to create these uh, nanoscale forms of silicon, ribbons, uh, wires, platelets, uh, membranes, and so on. And you can do this kind of process multiple times, work your way through the thickness of a wafer and create little, literally billions of these kinds of silicon nano uh, ribbons and nano membranes as building block materials for constructing uh, active systems. So that, that's kind of the, the way that it works. A lot of details around that, but that's the overall concept. So then the next question is, okay, now I have these little tiny pieces of silicon, how do I move them around so that I can organize them in uh, with the kind of engineering uh, control that you ultimately need to build a functional system. And there, uh, we've been able to develop some sort of soft printing type techniques that, that, that allow you to, to manipulate at high speed with uh, incredibly high levels of control, these very tiny, very fragile nanoscale pieces of semiconductor material. And the process involves doing that kind of undercut etching I just described to you to create what is essentially like an inking pad where the ink is the sem semiconductor nanomaterial itself. You take a stamp with raised features of relief on its surface, very soft material, so it's unable to deliver sort of forces at levels that would crack these materials, but you can bring it into contact with that sort of sem uh, semiconductor uh, inking pad. Uh, contact that the Van der Waals forces will be significantly uh, large to uh, maintain adhesion between these semiconductor uh, nano elements in the surface of the stamp so that when you peel the stamp back, you basically ink the raised regions of the stamp with the material. And you keep those uh, ribbons tethered to the underlying wafer at anchored points so that they don't just wash off into the etching bath. That, that's the key thing. So as you peel the stamp uh, back, you fra fracture the anchors. The uh, semiconductor material is now inked onto the surface of the stamp. You just in index the stamp over to a target surface. Could be a sheet of plastic, could be a plate of glass, could be a slab of rubber. And then just in a contact process, you print out uh, arrays of these uh, uh, tiny uh, elements of, of materials. And so the trick here from a physics standpoint is how do I switch the adhesion strength from strong to weak to allow high efficiency inking and printing uh, with, with, with a stamp material. And there are a variety of ways to do that. I won't get into the details, but this can work 
at spectacularly high levels of efficiency and uh, positioning accuracy throughput as well. Millions of these uh, elements can be process per hour using a, a step and repeat type of process for printing. You can do all of that in an automated uh, fashion with, with an engineered tool to do the printing. And these are uh, used in commercial production for uh, micro LED uh, displays and uh, high concentration pho photovoltaics. I'd be happy to talk more about that if you're interested, but it's a tool that allows that process to be um, executed in a highly automa automated controlled uh, manner. So this is what it looks like. You have a high density of these semiconductor nano elements uh, in a sequence of printing steps. You can now spread them out uh, at any aerial coverage on any kind of substrate because you're doing this at, at room temperature. So you can get a, a very high temperature material like monocrystal and silicon onto a low temperature substrate like uh, PET uh, or uh, silicone uh, rubber. And that, that's kind of how it works. And it works really well. So this is an example of silicon uh, nanomembranes printed out onto a sheet of plastic, subsequently wrapped around uh, a glass cylindrical support, just to show you the mechanical flexibility, which follows from the thin geometry of the substrate, the thin geometry of the semiconductor uh, material. Also, it's really highlighting that linear reduction in the en energy release rate with thickness of the semiconductor, because these elements are not popping off as you bend the substrate, so the adhesion is very robust. It's sort of that sticky characteristic that follows from the nanoscale geometry. In this particular case, we printed 1,600 of these things over a macro scale area with 100% yield using the printing approach that I just described to you along with that automated tool. So all of that works. I'm not going to say anything more about it. Once you have high performance semiconductor on plastic, you can go through a set of processing steps to define uh, you know, the metallization that you ultimately need, the interconnects to build functional systems. And so how does this come together in the form of a neural interface is what I'll describe now. So this is an active um, uh, piece of electronics that provides um, a number of, uh, a large number of unit cells, each one of which is uh, configured as a conductive interface to the surface of the brain to monitor local electrical activity. And there's a backplane of electronics here that's doing per channel amplification and allowing for active matrix multiplexing. So I don't have to run a separate pair of wires to every unit cell in this array. And that's the kind of architecture that allows you to build your high resolution display. It's a key architecture for any kind of scaling of a, uh, of a system of, of, of this type. And so it's qualitatively different than an array of electrodes because you have the active uh, backplane of electronics behind it. And you can kind of see that as I break down you know, the, the individual unit cell, you see that gray metallization that's uh, platinum black. It's a low impedance interface to uh, biological tissue, the surface of the brain in this case. And at each unit cell sitting up under those uh, electrodes is uh, a set of electronics. At each unit cell, it's two nanomembrane based transistors. One is serving as a buffer and amplifier. The other one is serving as a switching element for multiplex to dressing. Uh, and so this particular system has a few hundred of such, uh, such nanomembrane transistor. And it's all on very thin plastic, so it's very flexible, floppy. You can roll it up in a tube, deliver it uh, via catheter. You can wrap it around a soft insert, so it becomes a probe that allows you to um, do mapping uh, in the interhemispheric fissure or down into the sulci of the brain, for example. Or you can just unfurl it and laminate it on the surface of the brain. And this is a feline model of epilepsy. This is through a collaboration that we had with uh, uh, neuroscience re researchers at University of Pennsylvania. And so this is providing you know, the highest resolution um, mapping of neural activity on the surface of a, of a large uh, mammal uh, animal model that, uh, that, that's possible and enabled by the silicon nanomaterials in the backplane of electronics. As I mentioned before, you can not only map the surfaces, but also hidden surfaces. You fold it in half. In this case, we plunged it down into the fissure between the right and left hemispheres of the brain of this uh, feline uh, model. So, so you can do sort of unique things uh, as a result of the, the uh, extremely high levels of bendability uh, of the electronics. And so this is sort of what it looks like. This is a, um, uh, an image of one of our devices on uh, a CAT model. And these are uh, sort of conventional non-electronics enabled passive electrodes uh, to sort of set the scale. And I'll, I'll roll the movie here. This is um, basic, basically a color uh, rendering of an epileptic seizure. The um, graph at the bottom represents the time dependent uh, voltage trace associated with an individual unit cell in this array. And then as I mentioned, right above that graph is a color representation of the spatiotemporal patterns of um, potential that you're measuring on the surface of the brain as uh, the cat is undergoing a seizure. This is a, a pharmacologically induced seizure um, 
uh, created by delivery of a picrotoxin. And so what you see is there's initial uh, incubation period, so the anomalous activity, and then the seizure really kicks in. It corresponds to this recurring spiral wave instability and a physical manifestation of, of the seizure. And this goes on for five seconds. The, this is very dramatically slowed down compared to real time. So the x-axis on the graph at the bottom there is in seconds. So five seconds in, suddenly the, this, uh, this spiral wave instability just uh, annihilates itself. The seizure goes away and nobody understands that. And so the, the purpose of this platform is as a research tool for studying neural processes such as those associated with epilepsy. Now, it's important to uh, note that this was published in 2011. So in some ways, it's ancient history. But the problem uh, that we um, I ended up grappling with is it's very hard with these very thin uh, geometry uh, uh, devices to keep biofluids out of the actively powered backplane electronics. It's critical for the operation of this device. But if there's any leakage currents back out of the device, it has uh, really bad consequences for the animals. And, and it makes it very difficult to study neural processes in a chronic mode. And so as a material science challenges, it's extremely difficult to create a defect-free, perfect biofluid barrier that can cover micros macroscopic areas like we're talking about here, centimeter square uh, areas. And so we got stuck on that problem for about half a decade, but eventually solved it. And I won't get into the details, but uh, it involves uh, the development of extremely high quality, extremely thin layers of glass. So this is thermally grown silica, submicron in thickness, but with structural perfection that allows it to be used as a perfect biofluid barrier over the entire areas of these systems. And this is kind of a high water mark for us. This is a thousand and eight channels uh, encapsulated with that um, thermally grown silica layer. So it's not really impacting the flexibility, but, but it, it serves as a spectacular biofluid barrier that um, is really unmatched in, in its performance and is really enabling us to do um, some very advanced neuroscience studies. As you can see, this was just published this year. So it's very flexible. We can uh, uh, build these devices at very high yields and they offer uh, you know, unmatched uh, levels of spatiotemporal resolution in uh, neural mapping. And so we worked with uh, collaborators on non-human primates, so sort of moving up the, the food chain, so, so to speak, and the sophistication in neural, neural activity. And this is an example of a visually evoked uh, uh, response on the visual cortex mapped in real time with one of these thousand channel systems uh, in, in a uh, macaque-based uh, uh, model uh, study. So, so this is very, very exciting for us. This is big data, just to give you a sense of what the total data output of a device like this is. Um, more than a thousand channels, each channel is being sampled at five kilohertz. And so you can imagine the uh, amount of data that can be accumulated, it's really spectacular. And, and so there are lots of opportunities for machine learning and artificial intelligence to be applied to these uh, massive data sets. But this just gives you an example, it's a visual representation of that visually evoked potential at a per channel level. And you can see the, the um, also the yields. I mean, there are a few channels here that are dead, uh, but you know it's 98% yields or something like that. It's a very high quality piece of electronics in that sense, and it's useful to sort of benchmark in comparison, uh, comparison to to what other um, you know, groups have been able to do. And I think the key differentiator here is the active matrix backplane allows us to scale to way higher levels of uh, density in in electrodes and and total numbers of electrodes. So on the x-axis, density, numbers of electrodes on the y-axis, and this is where we're sitting here. Uh, and all uh, previous uh, reports of uh, micro electrocorticography systems are uh, you know, indicated by the blue dots. And so, so this, is, um, this is kind of where, where we are. And you might ask, you know, does this really scale? Is this an academic curiosity for a small size or, or can you really think about brain scale mapping systems using these ideas? And I, I think it is scalable. And so this was a demonstration that we put together just to show how all of these building blocks can kind of be assembled and, and be used to, to, to build things at, at a full organ scale, you know, in, in terms of size and at variable densities tailored to the anatomy is another thing that you can do just by programming that printer system so that you can control in a spatial way the, the, the mapping density to, to make efficient use of your active electronics. So anyway, we didn't do animal uh, model experiments with this platform. We just showed that you could put all the materials, the manufacturing science together to be, begin to build things that are scales that uh, ha haven't been previously achieved. I think this is 30,000 30, channels or something uh, on that order at, at human brain scale dimensions, roughly. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing in the, in the area of electri uh, electrical 
neural interfaces uh, fo focused on, on the brain. But let, let me spend the rest of my talk, I think I have 20, 20 minutes or so uh, left, on um, optical interfaces. It's a totally different way to think about interfacing with neural tissues and, and really sort of a set of uh, breakthroughs in genetic modifications that, that emerged from uh, labs at Stanford and, and MIT and, and other places. Um, go in 2000, 2008, 2009, that, that type of time frame. And this is a nice review article written by the Stanford group in 2011. And so the idea is that it's possible to genetically modify mice, a whole a range of other species at this point, uh, at this point um, to uh, create uh, light sensitivity in specific targeted uh, types of neurons uh, in, in the brain. And, and so what that allows you to do is to use um, photons rather than electric fields to either stimulate neural activity or inhibit neural activity with cell type specificity. It's totally impossible with electrical interfaces, which have historically been very valuable for neuroscience research, but they have all sorts of parasitics associated with unwanted heating, associated with current flows. They're nonspecific. You're um, really activating or inactivating entire volumetric regions of neural tissue. It's very hard to control. And the kind of uh, precision that, that's enabled by optogenetic techniques is really spectacular. So I was watching this, this uh, uh, field uh, de develop and very, very excited about it and thinking about you know, how could we contribute to this space from the standpoint of uh, advanced neuroengineering, advanced material science, some of the things that we we're doing, electrical interfaces. And it was immediately obvious what the opportunities were because if you uh, take a look at the way the earliest optogenetic experiments were being done is basically these genetically modified uh, animal models, and then the way that the light was being introduced into the relevant parts of the brain, it was just using fiber optic technology that Ben and I were working on back in the Bell Labs days. You know, it was just off-the-shelf telecommunication fiber, fiber ferrules. Ben remembers these things. We're doing all kinds of fiber work with Ben back in the day, and I was thinking, wow, that's great for telecommunications. It looks like it's pretty lousy, you know, for, uh, you know, in terms of a mechanism for injecting light into the brain of an animal, because it's obvious. I mean, you had this large, um, you know, cylinder of glass, high modulus material, you got to push into this soft neural tissue and you got all the motion artifacts. And then the worst thing is that the other end of the fiber is connected to an external light source, typically a laser sitting on a bench top, you know, and so you have a physical tether that's uh, constraining the natural movements of the animal. And ultimately you want to use optogenetic techniques to turn on or off specific neural circuits to look at the effect on the behavior of the animal to tease out the function of the brain. That's the whole point. But if the hardware that you're using to deliver light to the brain is modifying those behaviors, then it sort of confounds uh, the research that you're trying to do. And so we figured, well, maybe there are ways to create super small LEDs, use these sort of semiconductor nanomaterial ideas, not in the context of a transistor, but maybe a light emitting diode. And then maybe you can get rid of the external light source, get rid of the fiber optic cable, inject these tiny LEDs directly in the brain and run like that. And so it turns out that you can do all of that. And we were working on um, three, five semiconductor technologies, nanomaterial technologies to complement what we were doing with silicon in parallel anyway. Uh, outside of the context of uh, optogenetics because we thought a very tiny light source would be an interesting building block for a display technology. And we're still working on that uh, in, in parallel. But, but the same ideas in sort of anisotropic undercut etching allow you to free from an underlying growth substrate very high quality layers of indium gallium nitride. And so you can create then micro scale LEDs where the lateral dimensions of the LEDs are defined by lithography and etching. The thickness is really defined by just the active material thickness that you need for operation of the device, thereby bypassing a lot of the constraints associated with dicing, uh, wafer dicing approaches to uh, create LEDs, sort of the standard way to do that where the thickness of the supporting wafer defines the thickness of the LEDs and the precision of your wafer saw or your laser scribe is defining the limits in the lateral dimension. So you bypass all, all, all of those constraints and you can uh, immediately start to build exceptionally tiny LEDs. And here's an example. Here's a, a high quality indium gallium uh, nitride blue LED with lateral dimensions comparable to an individual neuron. So it's the size scale of an individual cell actually much thinner than, than a cell, maybe, maybe a few, few microns in thickness. And by comparison to the fiber optic cable, this is what it looks like. Here's one of our micro scale LEDs sitting on top of a fiber optic cable of the type that's used in traditional optogenetic studies. So, so we know how to create these things, same ideas I described in the context of the electronics. We know how to move them around with the stamps, same concepts. We can put them on very thin sheets of uh, plastic that we can, um, 
uh, lithographically defined into sort of filamentary needle type shapes. We can do multiple LEDs. We can wire them up using lithography. They're thin enough where you can just do edge over metallization. So wire bonding is not necessary. You just use photolithographically defined PDD metal to do this. And you end up with a device that's so thin, you, can, you have space, you have room, you can um, you know, integrate other devices uh, co-located with these LEDs, photo detector, maybe an electrode for measuring electrical activity or stimulating neurons electrically, integrated temperature sensor, I'll come back to that in a second, you stack it all up, you still have a device that's super thin, maybe 25 microns in thickness, so flexible in fact, because of that small thickness, it's not stiff enough to even penetrate down into the brain. And so what we do is we define a much thicker polymer micro needle as a temporary support to provide the kind of rigidity that we need to inject these devices down into the brain. Uh, and then we bond it uh, with a bioresorbable glue so we can uh, pull out the injection micro needle after we've delivered the device down to the targeted uh, region of the brain of interest. But this is one of these devices for these cellular scale LEDs, very thin filamentary polymer uh, support threaded through the eye of the needle and sort of wrapped around the shaft to give you a sense of the flexibility what we're talking about. Way, way, many orders of magnitude more flexible than an optical fiber. This is what it looks like injected down. So you have a uh, stereotactic apparatus. There's the optoelectronics. There's the exposed region of the uh, brain. Uh, def uh, cranial defect has been formed surgically. Inject it down, apply artificial cerebrospinal fluid to accelerate the dissolution of that bioresorbable adhesive, pull out the uh, injection microneedle. Now you have a full fully integrated cellular scale piece of optoelectronics down into the depth of the brain with interconnect traces coming up out that allows you to um, you know, integrate control electronics and power systems for operating these uh, devices. Now, I won't go into the details. I mean, you may be asking yourself, okay, now I have a light bulb essentially in the brain. What am I doing about thermal management? And this is a whole story. I don't have time for it. I'll go, th go through it if you, if you have questions, but the thermal management in the brain is very challenging because uh, the neural tissue starts to degrade for temperature increases above about one degree Celsius. So you got to keep the temperature, maximum temperature associated with operation of the LEDs much below one degree. Tenth of a degree is better and that's what you can achieve with these tiny LEDs and there's a number of factors that come into play there but, but thermal management becomes uh, very very important but it's, but it's an involved story so I'll skip over it. So now you have LEDs down in the brain. How do you light them up and how do you control them? You can't put a battery on the on the head of a mouse. A mouse is a very tiny thing, and uh, you know battery is a heavy thing. So, so what you really want is to get rid of the battery. So we use wireless uh, power transfer. So we we have a harvesting antenna, uh, a rectifier that delivers power down to the uh, implanted LED, and then we just modulate the uh, power of the RF source to turn it on and off. So you have a remote control, battery free, fully implantable device. It's under the skin here. Uh, LEDs in the brain of that animal, uh, and that's what it looks like. So now you can do optogenetic studies. So one of the uh, prototypical um, examples of an optogenetic assay involves uh, a genetic modification uh, to neurons that are responsible for the pro production of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that creates a pleasure sensation. And by optically um, illuminating those uh, neurons with these uh, LEDs, you can stimulate the production of dopamine, create a pleasure response in the animal, and then you can train the animal on that basis. So without a physical reward. So an example is illustrated here. So this is a heat map of how an animal is moving around this Y maze enclosure. Typically the mice like the endpoints of these y, y type mazes. And you can see uh, for this given animal spending most of the time in an equally, uh, equal amount of time in each of those uh, uh, three arms of, of the Y maze. Now, if you take that animal, it's optogenetically activated. You have the implantable LEDs, and now you, uh, you know, turn on the RF, activate the LEDs every time the animal is in this left, uh, right-hand branch of this Y maze. You do that enough, and you establish a place preference. Now, the animal loves that part of its environment. And even if you're not operating the, operating the LEDs anymore, it will always stay right there. And so, so it's just an example of how, how you can do things. I'll show you a, a really intriguing way that you can exploit that response um, you know, in, in, in a much more sophisticated, maybe slightly disturbing way. I'll, I'll give, you, give you that example in a second. But the advantage of these uh, fibers is they not only remove the physical constraint and allow more natural behaviors, but it also allows you to study social interactions and social groups. 
because now the animals don't get tangled up. You know, if you had fiber optic cables on multiple animals, they immediately get tangled uh, with one another and it, and it just doesn't work. And they also love to gnaw, gnaw on the fiber ferrules. And so, so it's impossible. But with these fully implantable, you know, wireless uh, LEDs, it's no problem. You, you can do entire social groups as I was um, just, just illustrating with this movie. And so in this particular case, every time the mice enter this left-hand portion of their environment, this uh, part, of, part of their cage uh, identified with this uh, red dash box, uh, the uh, LEDs illuminate, uh, dopamine production is stimulated, and they begin to develop an affinity for this part of their cage. But the intriguing thing is this, you can use the same mechanism to um, drive social preferences. So for example, and this is unpublished results, it's brand new stuff, but uh, we have three animals optogenetically uh, modified, each one of which has an implantable LED. And in this case, we have slightly more sophisticated electronics, so we can independently and programmably determine when any of these three LEDs uh, is, uh, is on. And so we have vision systems that allow us to activate the LEDs in this particular case, whenever animal A1 is close to A2. And if A2 gets close to A3, there's no activation. If A1 is close to A3, no activation. It's unique to when there's a pairing between A1 and A2. And if you do that long enough, these animals start to develop deep friendships, deep bonds. They like to hang out together all the time. And the interesting thing is after you stop that optogenetic stimulation, that friendship bond persists. It's absolutely mind blowing. And so these, these are all male animals, if you're wondering, <laughs> just to uh, eliminate the confound associated with uh, sexual uh, you know, effects. And so then the other interesting thing is you can make A1 and A2 like one another, and then you stop with that. And then now you reprogram the system so that whenever A2 is near A3, you light them up. And then you can create a, a friendship bond between A2 and A3, eventually the bond between A1 and A2 dissipates. And so it's like John. friendship on demand with, with optogenetics. And so it's really a, a crazy type, type of thing, uniquely enabled by these, uh, by these types of types. John, of if it just a little, um, um, maybe uh, a few minutes for the questions at the end, that would be, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up here in three minutes. So, so, um, you, you can put these LEDs anywhere, peripheral nerve, spinal cord. Uh, they don't affect um, uh, you know, mo locomotor uh, be behaviors. There, there are a lot of different things you can do, different types of species. So you can do birds, bats, snakes, fish. One thing uh, about social preferences, we're wondering if you can make, um, make a, 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 a mouse love, love a bird. You know, that, that might be kind of crazy, but, but you, could, you could do that. You, you can do fish, you can do things underwater, as I mentioned. Uh, and so um, these devices are commercially available. There are a number of uh, systems now that are actually installed in Australia in uh, very, various research labs across Australia. So we put together a small company to make these technologies more broadly available because we're getting a lot of inbound requests for, for access to these devices. And so um, you know, they're, they're rev readily uh, available, very, very cost, cost effective type, type of systems. So I think I'm just gonna skip ahead. You, you can do more than just illuminate. You can also measure neural activity by measuring fluorescence. So you can have LEDs that are stimulating fluorescence and then co-located photo detectors to measure the amplitude of the fluorescence. So you can not only stimulate or inhibit, but you can track neural activity and you can do that in a closed loop fashion uh, as well. New, new technologies of that sort and requires sort of a data communication capability. The electronics gets a little more sophisticated, but, but you can do all of that, all battery free, fully, fully wireless. Um, fully implantable uh, as well. And sort of the penultimate, I come back to this idea of optoelectronic or, or uh, bioelectronic uh, medicines. You can really begin to think about how to use engineering approaches like these to treat different disease states. And we work closely um, with uh, folks at the medical school at Washington University to develop a full integrated system that allows closed loop control of uh, bladder, voiding uh, in particular, to address a condition known as overactive bladder, using an optogenetic uh, uh, interface to the bladder, a strain gauge to measure extent of filling of the bladder, and then um, a base station uh, radio control unit that serves as a, a bi bi-directional uh, interface for, for controlling uh, the devices. And so because I think I'm a little short on time, I'm gonna skip through this, but you can put all this together and you can control bladder activity in, in a closed loop uh, fashion uh, in, in that way. And so just to, to wrap up, I, I hope I've uh, been able to sort of highlight a couple of platforms that are 
may be interesting as neural interfaces based on semiconductor nanomaterials, one based on silicon, uh, the other one based on 3,5s, indium gallium nitride uh, in particular, uh, both configured for different types of interfaces, electrical and optical, uh, but they're tools that you know, not only uh, you know, can open up new research opportunities such as these social preferences, but, but eventually I, I think and I hope they will also serve as the foundations for new forms of therapies for, for treating uh, neuro neurological diseases, various forms of uh, neuro uh, de degeneration as well. So just to conclude, I'll, I'll highlight the senior collaborators uh, we work with over the years uh, in engineering science and neuroscience and medicine. And I'll conclude just by acknowledging really, really spectacular collection of uh, postdocs and graduate students who do all the work. So th thank you for the atten uh, your attention. And thanks again, Ben and Omid, for, for the invitation. Wow. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. That's, that's amazing. I don't know where to start. Uh, but uh, for um, I have myself, I don't know, a lot of questions, but I just want to open the floor for, for our um, attendees here to use the raise hand feature of Zoom, and then they go and open their mic. Um, I'm just monitoring for anyone who has a raise. If there is no question, I start as my questions myself. Let me just uh, double check again. Okay, no one. Okay, uh, John, you mentioned that you have, um, um, especially about the paper that is published uh, about a, year, uh, a decade ago, it's pretty much like a CMOS image sensors that you made it flexible and you made the ECOG, you know, micro ECOG out of it for a very, um, you know, a very um, incredible job that you did there. But I think that is limited at the moment to the research, uh, let's say, lab, in vivo studies in the lab, because there should be problems around power and data, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, or, that's right. It's, it's sort of a research platform for non-human primates, feline models. We've, we've done, as I mentioned, canine studies as well. Um, we've deployed sort of um, smaller scale versions in, in rats. You, you can do that. They're, they're very stable chronically with this um, thermally grown silica based um, biofluid barrier. That, that was a big problem you know, for us for a very long long time is keeping the fluids out as I mentioned. But um, you know, we have devices that have operated uh, as long as two years in, in rat models. So I think I view it kind of as a, a research tool, a research platform as you're suggesting. Although um, there's no reason why in principle it couldn't be useful in, in the context of uh, use with, with humans. And, and I think yep. there would be two opportunities. Probably the, the near term opportunity would be as um, one of these ECOG platforms, as I'm sure you're aware, that's used to map electrical activity in the context of these reception procedures to treat epilepsy. And that was the uh, initial area of interest when we were working with the, the PIN group. And we still work with those guys. Uh, is to eliminate sort of the resolution limitations associated with those mapping arrays as used on human patients, set by the fact that there's no multiplexing electronics. So, so being able to push the resolution and maybe enhance the diagnostic utility of platforms like that. Uh, but the but the leakage currents were scaring the hell out of us. I mean, because you know leakage into a, a cat model is one thing. You know, into a human is, is they can't even begin to contemplate it. Although I would say that in general. The physicians that we've worked with are a lot more aggressive and a lot more enthusiastic about getting new technologies onto human patients than, than I am. Like, I'm pretty scared about it <laughs> because something goes wrong. But I think they have a little bit different uh, perspective because in many cases, their patients are suffering from like severe debilitative diseases and, and they sort of balance the risk of the disease with the risk of the device and they kind of look at it in a different way. So I guess my, my point there is that if we wanted to push towards human use and we wanted to go go in that direction, there's no shortage of uh, physicians who, who would be happy to collaborate with us in, in, yep. in that direction. But like I said, we really haven't you know, got the biofluid barrier issue under control until fairly recently. I mean, that SPM paper was just published this year. And so, so we feel pretty comfortable about it, but, but it's, it's kind of e evolving. So it was a great question, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of where things are. Uh, okay, Anusha, can you open your mic? Um, thank you very much, John, for a wonderful presentation. I'm on computer science. 
Um, I've been working in a similar research area, epidermal electronics, but from human interaction point of view. Uh, we frequently cite your work and we are always inspired. Uh, I have a question about uh, how to bring uh, this work in uh, to uh, especially non-invasive stuff, your epidermal electronic stuff, into uh, use by general public. So uh, in my research, I use uh, fabrication methods that are uh, readily available, like uh, do-it-yourself things like screen printing. Uh, we recently did a tactile interface. Uh, I think you uh, have recently also built a tactile interface. These can be used in, for example, enabling technologies with people with disabilities, uh, completely non-invasive. Uh, do you have any um, future research that would go into this direction where uh, to create uh, more accessible technologies uh, in terms of uh, fabrication? Because right now, they are the very advanced, unit advanced fabrication environment. Uh, is there any uh, yeah. today's point? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. And and actually, you know, before you know, we we launched the, the the seminar, I was chatting with Ben, and he was giving me an overview of the the institute and the interest in human health and stuff. And when he was describing all of that, I almost concluded I put together the wrong slide set, right? Because uh, you know what I focus on is neural interfaces, and it was a little bit more kind of in a research realm, if not human translation in its focus. Uh, but we do a lot, you know, in non-invasive devices. I could could have given a uh, you know a, a presentation on that topic, maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we we have devices. I mean, th this is one of them. I don't know if you can you can see this, I, on, you know, on, on my video feed. But this is a um, an epidermal platform that we've designed for monitoring vital signs, clinical grade ICU uh, grade vital signs in. Uh, maternal, fetal, neonatal, and pediatric patients, because we feel like those patients um, you know, strongest need kind of a wireless skin interface alternative to what's used in hospitals today, premature babies specifically. So we published a paper last year on um, wireless um, epidermal devices for monitoring of uh, ECG, PPG, respiration rate, and temperature in premature babies. and. Um, you know, those are deployed at, at Lurie Children's Hospital and Princess Women's Hospital here in Chicago. I think we've probably done 150 premature babies or so, establishing the um, clinical precision, the accuracy of the data by compare, comparing directly to the standard taped-on wired-based devices. So we started a company around those technologies, and this is kind of the commercialized version, um, about a year and a half ago because Bill Gates uh, approached us about deploying those technologies into lower and middle income countries where there's no monitoring technology. Forget about the nuisance of the wires. They don't have anything, right? And so, so he put uh, together a funding package uh, teamed with the Save the Children Foundation. And so we're deployed uh, in 15, co 15 countries, five continents, something like that. In Africa, we're in um, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. We'll be in India and Pakistan later this year. A few thousand devices will touch 10,000 patients by the end of the calendar year. I spent two weeks in Zambia in December, seeing what's going on. But they're they're uh, they're working quite well, you know, in these um, in these health clinics. And the um, and I think the vision for Africa is sort of similar to what they did with telecommunications. They went straight to cell phones and just leapfrog landlines. And so I think the vision in terms of hospital care is. Don't try to reproduce the old school, you know, wire-based systems. It's too costly. It doesn't work that well. Just go straight to wireless, you know, go straight to the cell phone, the iPhone equivalent, right? And that's kind of what we hope to, to contribute. So, so that company is funded at a, at a pretty high level with these um, philanthropic organizations, but they also have a, um, a joint, development with, uh, Dra uh, joint development agreement with uh, Draeger, Anthem, uh, and Janssen uh, around, you know, uh, deployments in in Europe and in the U.S. So anyway, I could go go on and on. We we have uh, activities that, that are really focused on human patients, non-invasive monitoring, and I'm sure you you have kind of interest in that space as well. I think it's a super fruitful direction for you know academics, right, to put things together. And uh, as you point out, if it's non-invasive, you get it on skin. It's not a big problem to get uh, you know uh, approvals to go on to patients. You know, we we have. Um, IRB approval for studies of devices like those, but for different patient populations. I think we have like 13 or 14 different 
IRB studies ongoing. We have clinical coordinators. It's probably 300 patients roughly across the medical complex here in Chicago. And so I'd encourage you, you know, to, to continue on in that direction. I, th I think there's a real opportunity to make a, a powerful impact and we're kind of doing what we can do, but you know, you guys probably have different ideas, different materials, different use cases. There's no shortage. I mean, the hospital environment is very pro problem rich. You know, they're, they're looking for great ideas, new materials, engaged engineers. It's been an uh, unbelievable, you know, direction that we've kind of taken our research the last 10 years. And uh, I think I'll finish up my career in that direction. John, uh, absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, um, um, I think, you know, um, the, the, and sometimes you are you are amazed. You're attending a clinic and with the unmet needs that you just observe and say we are in 2020 and all of these problems should have been solved. Yeah, <laughs> and crazy. it's, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, um, I think we have to wrap up in a few minutes. We have, um, you know, one hand up and two questions asked. So I have to choose. So I go to Thomas, uh, because he had his hand up for a, for a while, and, I, and then I ask you if you have time to answer one more question and then wrap up, because you know uh, the interest is just so huge. Uh, Thomas, can you unmute, please? Yes, it's going to be a quick question. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, very interesting talk. I was wondering um, how the encapsulation due to a foreign body response affects the efficiency of the implanted LEDs in optogenetics. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so the LEDs are a little bit easier in terms of fibrotic response and, um, you know, variations in interface impedance that tend to plague, um, you know, electrode interfaces um, because you just need to get photons through, right? And so um, I think our experience is from a practical standpoint, it's a lot easier to manage that optical interface than it is uh, an, an electrical interface. You shine right through the the fibrotic overgrowth or the, you know, the immune response, you just illuminate through it. And um, it hasn't been a problem. I mean, these, um, these LED probes that I was talking about, we've had uh, devices running two and a half years, no, no problem in individual uh, mouse models. Typically, the, you know, our collaborators get tired of maintaining the animals or the animals die of old age. It's not a, a device limitation, you know, and, and I think that's another powerful aspect of optogenetics, quite frankly, compared to electrical interfaces. I mean, there are many, many advantages, but that, that's one of them. I mean, I think the big disadvantage really is uh, questions around human translation, you know, and how is that going to work, you know, genetically modifying human, you know, neural tissue. I'm not sure you know, when that's going to happen. Hopefully it would, but, but uh, for animal model studies, I, as you probably know, I think optogenetic techniques are uh, you know, to really uh, establish themselves as a, as a core methodology that's required for uh, neuro, neuro study, brain function studies. Yep. Fantastic, John. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are almost five minutes over time. Uh, um, I can see there, there are questions there, but I think um, it should be okay if uh, some of our colleagues approach and ask the questions offline, or maybe we collect them and send it to you. Um, we will be managed that way. Thank you very much, John. And you know, I'm really happy for you and Ben to meet each, <laughs> to meet each other yeah, again. Yeah, we both have a lot of gray hair now. It's like a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, stay safe and and um, thank you very much again. Bye bye. Yeah, okay. Thank Brilliant, you. John. Bye -bye. Thanks, mate. Thank stay safe. Bye -bye. Brilliant yeah. stuff. Bye.